there's a very useful concept um, called the inventor's dilemma. And it um, was introduced in the 1950s, but it became very popular among software writers and programmers. And the point of the inventor's dilemma is that sometimes when you're given a problem to solve, the best thing to do is actually to solve a different, bigger problem of which the smaller problem is part. And I suppose looking at marketing over the sort of 22 years in which I've worked in it, I think that's the greatest problem that marketing has faced. And uh, that actually it's looked at lots and lots of little problems, but it's never actually looked at itself. And the big problem it faces in many ways is that um, it's been displaced in business decision making by a different model. If you go back to the sort of madman era of American advertising, what was clear then is right the way up to the chief executive, it was axiomatic that better human understanding was a major key to business advantage. And I think this has been lost. And actually, I think the, the danger is the preoccupation. The most extreme example I ever came across of this was um, a friend of mine called Alex Batchelor, who was the marketing director of Orange in the UK, who was told by the finance director of, I think, Orange. He said, I don't need to know anything about customers. He said, everything I need to know about customers, I can tell from looking at a balance sheet. And this model, what I call the Aspergic Corporation, which is very, very good at everything, it's brilliantly talented at you know, measuring things, understanding the quantitative, but actually is completely deficient in human understanding. Um, it's a product of neoclassical economics. It's a product to some extent of the sort of, in some ways perhaps of the fall of socialism, the triumphalism of a sort of economic model. And it's a product of someone who thinks that effectively, you know, that everything important is numerically expressible. And also that the obverse is true, that, um, that actually things that are numerically expressible are by definition kind of important. And it's a very interesting case in, in terms of this instance of what you might call the Aspergic Corporation, which was a Channel 4 programme in the UK recently called The Undateables, which was slightly, it seemed slightly like freak show television when, when actually proposed. But it was a case of getting people who had either mental or physical disabilities or unusual qualities and getting them to find a partner. One of the candidates they had had Asperger's syndrome and was actually charming, intelligent, good-looking man in every respect, but lacked what's called a theory of mind. In other words, he couldn't quite understand how things would seem from another person's point of view. And what was actually sweet, funny, and charming about this is he went out on his first date and sat opposite a girl at a table in a pub where they'd arranged to have a date. And quite logically, very efficiently, economically, in fact, you know, any finance director would approve, he wasn't feeling hungry at the time, so he didn't order a meal and left his date actually eating on her own. <laughs> now, a perfectly rational economic decision, a perfectly rational individualistic decision, but utterly disturbing to the person you're actually dining with. You can't fault it on logical grounds, except that to anybody else, it's just freakish. I've got a friend who doesn't drink. He says, when I go on the dating scene, I have to pretend to drink. It is impossible to explain that you don't drink without coming across as a sanctimonious asshole. so I just steal myself and get mildly drunk. <laughs> and the problem is, I think, we're developing a sort of corporate philosophy, and it's become excessively powerful, where marketing and human instinct and human understanding and understanding of those things isn't represented at the boardroom level at all. And that, in a sense, is the problem we've got to solve. I think that the existence of behavioural economics, and more importantly, perhaps, the behavioural economics vocabulary, uh, will help us solve this problem. A lot of these problems come from people understanding a great man's one book without understanding the other book. As well as writing The Wealth of Nations, Adam Smith also wrote really what was perhaps the first book on behavioural economics, which is a treatise of, of uh, human nature, where he very much looked at human motivation around the business of esteem and respect of the community, and so forth. And nobody's read that, but everybody understands the central message of the invisible hand and that self-interest ultimately can translate into uh, the common good. Everybody understands that bit, they don't understand the other half. The same applies actually to Darwin. Everybody understands Darwin's first book, or they think they understand it and they like to believe they understand it, which is effectively survival of the fittest. 
that life proceeds and progress proceeds through a kind of accountancy function where nature is continually wheedling out waste, investing resources towards high-performing functions or functions that provide competitive advantage and actually stripping out expenditure or investment in, in other areas. It's a kind of, you know, billion-year-old efficiency drive. And everybody gets that bit. The second book of Darwin's, The Descent of Man and Selection in Relation to Sex, no one ever thinks about. And that's interesting because it shows that actually the job of marketing may not be to be perfectly you know, accountable, to justify itself. This is why I regard the idea of accountable marketing as actually a cop-out. Because it suggests that the future of marketing is basically a future of being completely deferential to the finance function and spending your whole life defending what you do on the grounds that honestly it isn't really wasteful and it probably does add more than it, it costs. And it seems too subservient an approach. And if you understand Darwin's second book, what you understand is that evolution actually has two mechanisms for working, not one. The second one is a marketing function alongside this finance function of efficiency and survival. And the marketing function, arguably the tension between the marketing function and the finance function in evolution is what has made evolution genuinely work. Now, the example that's always given of marketing and evolution in sexual selection is when you get a single runaway effect, like the peacock's tail. In order to actually give your genes a chance in the future, it's fairly important you share them with similarly genetic fit, genetically fit individuals. Uh, most blokes don't want to just spread them around everywhere, contrary to what you may have heard. It, it's advantageous to the gene that you are actually reasonably discriminating in where your genes end up. Now, of course, female peahens don't actually have a DNA sequencer, so what they've got to do is they've got to develop reliable indicators of genetic fitness that are visible and easy to, to detect. And one of them would be the tail in the peacock. It works at three levels. It's a very, very beautiful thing. It works at a handicap level, at the level of size. If you imagine a female peahen saying to a male peacock, you, well, you're, you know, you're claiming you're genetically fit, you're making quite a lot of noise, but prove it, a bloody great tail is pretty fantastic. Because you've got to be a pretty fit bird to carry around a decorative burden like that. The same is true of luxury goods expenditure, by and large, if you're a luxury goods brand. If women were merely attracted to men who had expensive vehicles, they'd all chase truck drivers and coach drivers. <laughs> but the truck and the coach are useless for signalling status because they actually have a function and a purpose. A red two-seater Ferrari kept in London, on the other hand, with no luggage carrying capacity whatsoever, that shows real, I've got resources to spare. It's a proof point in a way that a coach or a lorry isn't. And so the gratuitous waste of the tail is one of the ways in which the peacock illustrates fitness. Uh, through Zahavi's theory of handicapping. It also works at two other levels. The macro level is size, the median level is the symmetry of the eyes and the number of eyes on the tail and how symmetrically they're aligned, and the micro level is the translucence of the feathers. All three of them require pretty good DNA to produce at a successful level. So those operators are kind of marketing, and generally I think the finance function views marketing as a bit like this. It's a necessary act of gratuitousness in order to actually look attractive, but the world would be a lot more efficient if we could all agree not to do it. If peacocks could actually develop a kind of strategic arms limitation talks where tail length was maximised at six inches. <laughs> and so they tend to view the marketing function of evolution as a slightly undesirable side effect, until you realise that the best thinkers on sexual selection have come to the conclusion that humans are very largely a product of sexual selection. That actually, the marketing function of the human body, um, there is no functional reason for a male penis to be more than one inch long. Um, in fact, very large male gorillas who have different ways of demonstrating their, their desirability, not least sheer size, indeed have a penis that's one inch long. Does the job perfectly well. Um, there's no reason for female breasts to stick out of the body at all. Um, that female chimpanzees lactate and feed their young perfectly effectively while being completely flat-chested. So female breasts are indeed a form of advertising, or if you're particularly sexist, branded entertainment. Um, <laughs> but more interesting than this, human intelligence emerged this way. The belief is that it was a runaway effect that actually developing intelligence and equally vocabulary was useful in terms of sexual selection for thousands of generations before it became functionally 
uh, useful. We used words in our vocabularies to build relationships for thousands and thousands of years before we could use that ability to build railways. And Jeffrey Miller, very interestingly, describes sexual selection as evolution's R&D function and it's evolution's venture capital. It's the only way you can do something that doesn't have an immediate payoff in terms of actual efficiency, but which may have a long-term payoff. Uh, wings, by the way, you don't need a 20,000 word vocabulary to hunt elephants. You need about 15 words, like behind you, over there, and arg, okay? The, the, the 20,000 word vocabulary that most humans have is basically for reasons of impressing each other and developing chat up lines along the lines of how much does an adult polar bear weigh? I don't know, neither do I, but it breaks the ice. That kind of thing. <laughs> now, so vocabulary is a product just like the peacock's tail of sexual selection. Um, so are things like altruism. Jeffrey Miller's book, The Mating Mind, is very good on this. Love, romance, Commitment, all those things actually are a product of sexual selection, not the conventionally understood part of evolution. Art goes the same way. Um, interestingly, we tend to think of the peacock as being slightly pointless because the tail doesn't have any use. But most uh, evolutionists now believe that the power of flight, which evolved from flightless dinosaurs, the wings, there's not much use of having stubby wings below a certain length, unless you take into account sexual selection. So some birds developed particularly elaborate tails as a mark of plumage. Other birds developed bigger and bigger wings with which they could show off. And eventually, as sexual selection caused these wings to become bigger and bigger, as the venture capital of evolution, it actually developed birds which could use the wings to glide and then fly. So the way to look at this, effectively, is that a peacock is a chicken that's been taken over by the marketing department. <laughs> Um, but a penguin is an albatross that's been reclaimed by the finance function. <laughs> now, what's interesting about evolution is that it seems that most of the progress happens because of the tension between those two. There is a patent tension between both of those things. And the problem we have in modern day business is I think that the penguins have taken over a bit too much. And that the, the balance of power that they have has become a little bit excessive. Now, I came to this conclusion reading, I'm not an economist, I was a classicist by background, but I started reading books about economics. And I read the, the neoclassical model and thought what an incredibly neat and elegant idea it was, and how, what, how it was actually a pretty good way of understanding how people could actually buy commodities where the quality of the commodity and the nature of the commodity was not under debate. If you had perfect information about what you were buying, and furthermore that that commodity was also in scarce supply, this seemed to make a lot of sense. Like Daniel Kahneman, who won the 2002 Nobel Prize for Economics, even though he's not an economist, he's a psychologist, I also came to a secondary conclusion, which is, hell, you people actually believe we all decide like that all the time, don't you? You really do believe that. And the finance function of an organisation, whether you've trained as, as, as an accountant, whether you've trained, for example, or gone through business school, you will have had this neoclassical model of economics, the free market model, based on perfectly rational individual actors making decisions based on perfect information. You'll have had it rammed down your throat to a point where you actually believe it. Now, Hayek, an earlier winner of the Nobel Prize for Economics, spotted that there was something fundamentally wrong here. He said the failure of the economists to be more successful is what's called physics envy. We're so desperate to construct a mathematical science around what we do that we'll ignore significant elements of truth and reality in the pursuit of mathematical neatness. It's that old joke about physics, physicists saying, we've actually cracked horse racing. We know exactly who's going to win every race. All you have to do is assume that the horse is a perfect sphere and the race takes place in a vacuum. <laughs> that you actually lose a huge amount of information. And Hayek made the point that it's scientism. He's, you know, he makes the point that actually it's decidedly unscientific in the true sense of the word since it involves a mechanical, uncritical application of habits of thoughts to fields different from those in which they've been formed. And that's the problem of the business world today. People who formed their habits of thought in finance are now applying that thinking to human behaviour. And it's woefully wrong. Unlike the physical sciences, in economics, um, the uh, disciplines that deal with Complex phenomena, human behavior, meteorology uh, would be another example, um, mass human behavior, even more complex still. Uh, you can't get quantitative data necessarily for the things that really count. In the physical sciences, the things that really matter are mathematically expressible. Pressure, temperature, volume. All those kind of things you might want actually have mathematical expression. Not true in things like human behavior. 
What's really important may not have a metric behind it. And Hayek went on to say, in the physical sciences, the investigator will be able to measure what on the basis of a prima facie theory he thinks important. In the social sciences, often that is treated as important, which happens to be accessible to measurement. So it's that old, old uh, thing that Einstein have by, above his desk, which is not everything that counts can be counted, not everything that can be counted counts. And Taleb, the author of The Black Swan, an author of a forthcoming book called Anti-Fragility, makes exactly this point. That the number of things you can actually form scientific formulae for in real life is pretty tiny. Real complex life, complex systems which are non-linear and certainly, you know, and, and actually in many cases may be completely sort of counterintuitive and complex in their curvature, um, the usual, the trying to apply out of physics envy, the kind of methodology of physics to something like that is just fundamentally dangerous. But the neoclassical model is interesting in several respects. It's psychologically completely blind. It assumes just complete rational self-interest. It's ethically blind, which I think has caused problems in the business world. It does not ask any ethical questions at all. It just regards profit maximization as proof of virtue and asks nothing else whatsoever. It's entirely individualistic. Um, it sacrifices human concerns to mathematical neatness. It's system two. I, I don't know if you've come across this, the, the idea of the brain effectively operating at two levels. System two being our consciousness and the more rational part of the brain. I'll come to that later. Um, system one being by far the greater part of our processing power. And it dominates business decision making to a point where marketing has been frozen out. This is what I mean by this problem. Six billion was spent making the train journey from London to Paris reduced in duration, a numerical factor, from about three and a half hours to two hours, 55 minutes. You could have had a greater impact on human enjoyment of that journey by putting Wi-Fi on the train. There is still no Wi-Fi on the train. With six billion, you could have spent one billion employing all of the world's top male and female supermodels, got them walking up and down the train, handing out free Chateau Petrus to all the passengers. You'd still have five billion pounds in change, and people would ask for the trains to be slowed down. <laughs> But pleasure, enjoyment, irritation, regret, all those things do not have mathematical expression. There isn't a number. There isn't also a number for how nice the table is. The USP of a train versus an aircraft is you get a ruddy great table. You can put a laptop, a cup of coffee, a newspaper, and you can get on with your work on a train just as you could if you're in the office. But that's not a numerical measure, whereas duration utilization of rolling stock and speed are all numerical. So we start to prize the numerical over what's really important to us as human beings. Marketers, having said that, haven't done themselves any favors because the marketing model is 80 years old. It was designed purely for packaged goods being advertised on television. Um, but worst, it has no links with microeconomics or Darwinian signaling theory or anything done in the sciences since the 1950s. Worse still, it has the worst vocabulary you could imagine. Going to these finance guys and trying to get them interested in marketing and talking about brand iconography is like going to the head of thoracic surgery at St. Mary's Hospital Paddington and saying, trust to the healing power of the crystal. <laughs> As someone beautifully put it, he said, the language of marketing is like the language of astrology. It's very convincing if you're a fellow believer, but if you don't believe in astrology or you're a skeptic, it sounds appallingly like bullshit. I know this very well. My brother's actually an astronomer. He builds telescopes. And the worst thing that ever happens to him at a party is someone comes up to him and says, what do you do? I'm an astronomer. That's very interesting. I'm a Sagittarius. <laughs> um, but actually, there's something worse than that, which is if you want finance to get interested in marketing and human psychology and behavior, we've developed a vocabulary of our own which has lots of pitfalls. If you come from an engineering background or a finance background, which are very, very risk-averse disciplines, the worst thing you can do in life is to look a bit stupid. And we've created a vocabulary which makes it very easy for outsiders to look stupid by using slightly the wrong phrase. Indeed, we don't even, we're not even clear about the phrases we use ourselves. Brand can mean about 27 different things, depending on context or the whim of the speaker. So that's just a really important point, I think, that actually we haven't done ourselves any favours. Behavioural economics gives us a vocabulary which you can talk to finance in, without sounding either like an astrologer or terrifying the life out of the people.